The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Around about halfway through this, I th- I, it, it, what, what's he on now? What delivery? You say he's on. He's on. He's on eighty-two now, and you are number one hundred and two. Two. Yeah. Is that DPD? Uh, DHL. DHL. All right. So they're, they're... you're much better. They give you. They tell you the name of the driver and everything. No DPD do. No, this is DHL though. That's yeah, but what I said. DP... DPD. Oh, DPD. Much oh, okay. better. Yeah. Well, well, our one is Dave. You see, Dave the DPD driver. I like DPD, and they give you like an hour slot. But it, DHL yeah. just say, he's on. Well, he was meant to come yesterday, and he didn't. His lorry broke down, and I, uh, I got one text message to say um, it's going to be delayed, but it will be with you today. And at exactly the same time, I got an email saying it won't be with you today; it'll be with you tomorrow. So at that point, it was like, oh, do I stay? Do I go? Do I go home? What? So I just went home. All these first world problems. Well, th- this is all just to say that if um, if your version of Dave, D- DPD Dave knocks on the door, um, the podcast might end early. I get a ding dong. I won't hear it though. But it's, it's, for, it's for a good cause though, because you're getting your new monitor. Yeah, finally. Oh, yeah. And dear. I need it because I have been using this Curry's 80 quid monitor. Yeah. <laughs> me, me, meanwhile, yeah. Your, meanwhile, your son is gaming on a 1,100 pound monitor at your, uh, at your place. <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> of course he is. Where where are your priorities, Kev? The Fuji Cast. Honestly, right. Welcome to the Fuji Cast. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag, and of course, also through the Fuji Cast private Facebook group that you're welcome to become a part of. If you want to send a mail through, send it to click at fujicast.co.uk. If you're not a Fuji film shooter, do not worry. It's our big friendly community, and whatever flavour you shoot, you're very, very welcome. Thank you to those of our friends who are supporting us on Patreon, which, for the price of a cup of coffee, keeps the show growing. And uh, we have today Kev's Book of the Week. What do we have, Kev, Kev, for the Book of the Week? Book of the Week. Uh, Island Tides by Paul Glazier. Paul Glazier, isn't it? Wasn't he Starsky and Hutch or something? <laughs> was that? that was Paul Glazer. All right. Okay. I didn't know he was a photographer as well. There was and a Glazier, though, wasn't there? Uh, she was in Cagney Lacey. Wasn't she Glazier? Was she? Cagney, no. Obviously. Glazier, no, Glazier owns Manchester United, doesn't he? Oh, anyway, we'll get to the bottom of it. Um, and also we've got uh, Carl Hare is, is going to be here because uh, he's going to be answering... He's going to be answering questions. Any any video question you have at all, um, Carl Hare is uh, is going to be answering. Well, when I say anything that you have, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be posing in the questions. But I think he covers just about everything, Kev. Yeah, he, he is a very clever man. Yeah. We used to have a jingle for Carl, didn't we? Oh yeah, it was this one. Carl Hare. Hail to the chief engineer. There we go, chief engineer. He's he's <laughs> he's going to be on. Um. Right. Questions. Who's going to go first, Kev? Who's going to go oh, first? First. Why not? Go on, then. And just scrolling all the way to the bottom of the magic list. Oh, we got some new ones. Oh no, this one. This one. Jeff put in the questions for the show thread, and then he put it in separately, and uh, it caused a bit of a mini explosion. So the question was from Jeff Petri: How important is it for you to look at, review, and study the photography of others? Does doing so encourage or influence your own photography? Yeah, it's bound to, to an extent, isn't it? I, I would have thought. It will certainly influence you. Jeff Askoff, for example, was a, was an influence in the in the way that um, we both worked. Well, he was, but also at the same time, he would proclaim that he would never look at anybody, no other wedding photographer's work anyway. So. I never, yeah, I never really got that. I just, I, I've, 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 I've I've always thought looking at other wedding photographers' work is, is not a bad thing. It's good to know what's going on, isn't it? I, I, I feel like I saw this thread happen on the Facebook group and it was, there was quite a lot of conversation about it. And, and my personal opinion is, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, when I look at I look at other wedding photographers' work, I look at um, other ph- general photographers' work, and of course I think you have to be, um, like, inspired is the right word, and also it affects your, your thought process. It affects, you know, just the way you look at light. And uh, like one person's comment in the thread, and I can't, I'm just looking for it just now, I can't remember it, um, was like, you know, it's not called Rembrandt light for no reason you know Rembrandt painted his pictures with that beautiful kind of side light um, technique and then the whole world adopted it so uh, that doesn't mean they're copying but they're you know they're implementing a, a technique so yeah of course I think I think it's important to look at other people's work and and learn from it at least uh, yeah absolutely don't just copy it but I do I do not like it when you know especially kind of street photography and stuff like that where you know it's a public pic it's a public place it's a street corner or something and it's been photographed a million times before and then people proclaim that oh look i took that picture you're copying me 
Like, no, it's a street corner. It's anybody, you know, it's it's a well-photographed spot. Um, so, you know, I, I don't appreciate that. And I also, yeah, I mean, when, when especially wedding photographers say, uh, they don't look at other wedding photographers' work. Maybe they don't, and and that's fine. But they probably do. And you know, they if they, I look at other wedding photographers' work, and then I put myself in a little corner and cry. And that's oh, that's Kev. generally why people don't do it. <laughs> uh, who's inspiring you at the moment, Kev? What what um, what do you look at on online? Um, I look at the uh, Welsh FA's website. <laughs> I look at Euro 2020. Um, <laughs> I avoid the news. The front page of the news goes straight to the sport. Um, I didn't yeah, mean that, like, Kev. I meant photographers. Uh, the beer aisle, then the co-op. Oh. Really inspiring. You can get uh, a pizza and five beers for four. No, a pizza and four beers for five quid this week. How inspiring is that? Uh, Kev, but which photographers are you being inspired by? Honestly, I haven't. I really, <laughs> and I'm not saying this, no, I, I, I have not taken a picture in months it feels like uh and i've been you know busy doing other bits and pieces but you know i still look at my books and you know obviously we've got paul glazier's one today i've got um i backed another couple of uh this is a blue coat press book actually and i backed another couple of them today so i've you know a couple of photographers that i, I hadn't heard of that i kind of started going down the rabbit hole but yeah i mean i honestly i'm in i i'm inspired by anybody if it, a picture it could be a picture of a i don't know a, a an egg cup, but if it's if it's done well, it inspires me. It every, it's everywhere, isn't it? You know, I find myself scrolling through Instagram a lot more these days. It's very rare for me to to see a picture and think, "Oh my god, that's awful." And you know, I take my time to to look at the pictures of the ones that I like. Uh, a lot of street photography stuff. I do a lot of following of hashtags. Um, going down that rabbit hole. I'm I'm intrigued by this because you do back a lot of stuff. You're very good at stuff like this, Kev. Actually, you. Very supportive of, of other photographers' work. And well when but I'm intrigued because you said we well, you'd not heard of these photographers be- before. What what made you back them? And if these are unknown photographers, that kind of that's inspirational in itself because you think, well I've got a cracking idea in me. I wonder if I could go on, on Kickstarter and a wonderful human being like Kev would come along and support the um the, the furthering of this book or, or are these photographers just outstanding photographers anyway but you just happen not to have heard of them or yeah. are they really really new new names where you think oh that's a great project i'm gonna i'm gonna follow that no generally they're just new names to me blue coat press do a, a lot of the the kickstarts um campaigns for very established photographers who've never either been published or uh, never had the backing that they should have and, and often they're from the kind of 60 50 60 70s 80s so yeah that's that's what happens and because i've backed loads of books on kickstarter kickstarter keeps sending me emails now every time somebody you know puts a book up there but i don't i don't really back the the ones i typically back the ones where i feel like it's uh it's important for that body of work to be to be um published i don't back the ones where i think that it's just somebody needs the money to do a self-publish and it's not necessarily going to be an important body of work to the wider world rather than just themselves so i'm intrigued and i'm, put, I'm kind of putting putting you on the spot here but the the last one or maybe the last couple that you you supported what what was it about the project where you thought this body of work needs to be out there well the story generally that goes with it um so there was um i'm trying to think what ones i've got on order now let me hang on let me just i'm going to go to my kickstarter page yeah so the next one the one that hasn't been published yet uh oh oh actually yeah this is interesting so the one that one that hasn't been published yet but has was backed within 24 hours is uh parker fister's book which who we had as a guest yeah solitude uh, of solitude a picture and poem book by parker fister and he's his work i mean i said this when we when i interviewed him it was like his work astounds me it is so beautiful yeah um so he's he's raised sixteen thousand seven hundred and forty five pound already in, with 19 days to go so yeah so that one's coming but but prior to that um i have got uh, marilyn stafford's a life in uh photograph uh, a life in photography so um marilyn stafford uh very 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 well-known photographer in 1948 uh, according to this, uh, Marilyn Stafford's first photographic assignment was of Albert Einstein. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, you only start, you start, when I get the emails and I start reading about the photographer and the body of work behind them, it's that that kind of kicks my mind and thinks, yeah, I want this. And these are not necessarily always going to be pictures that I would want on my wall, 
well, I want to, uh, I feel like the, um, the, whatever is behind, often it's the legacy, the family legacy mm. that, you know, have all of this work that has, has not been published. And so uh, usually Colin at Blue Coat, but there's others, he, you know, he, he kind of gets the ball rolling and, and gets this stuff printed and done. Uh, so Island Tides, which is the one we've got now, the one we're going to talk about today, yeah. uh, just to give you some perspective on this. And this was backed by 211 people. Right. And they pledged 12. 12,507 euros and yeah it, this is all about the uh i'm not right it's, it's about an, an island so i'll talk about it when we do the book review more yeah. but the, definitely somebody i'd not heard of but then when i looked at the little video the, the kind of slideshow if you like of the photos i was like oh my word yeah these are beautiful these definitely need to be be uh put in print we should put some links up actually to today kev so that people can go and see these shouldn't we yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Right. although once they're backed they're right. backed that's it that's it okay that's it then go to your bookshops and get them and, uh, and usually Kickstarter stuff go up in value really quickly. Do they? All right. Well, mm -hmm. that's cool. Limited editions, you see. Um, David Shanley. Hello, Neil. I'm doing a wedding. Oh, this one's for me in, in August for a couple who are friends, which I'm looking forward to doing. Came across uh, one of your videos of a wedding, but uh, you, you used the still images that you recorded. I could hear the voices of the guests which I thought was fabulous, which is the, the photo film thing, isn't it, Kev? Um, my, my question is, what microphone did you use? I use an, a Fuji X-T4, lucky you, and also a Fuji X-T30. Uh, you, I like this. Your podcasts with Kevin are okay also. <laughs> oh, uh, nice of you to say, Dave. It's, it's more about the final product, really, David, not, not just the microphone. Um, so microphone-wise, I use a plethora of different ones. You can use a um, Tascam units. They're all lavalier lapel microphone units where you want to get the, the microphone as cr close to the uh, the voice box where the voice is coming from as uh, as you can because you want to get the, uh, the mic as close to the talent as possible. And then really it's all about mixing, and that's done in Premiere. Same way, Kev, that you make films, really. You know, if you were doing a Talking Heads um, yep. into the premiere timeline or Final Cut or whatever you use, um, uh, Da Vinci, etc. And and then, yeah, that's where the magic happens, really. It's not so much about the microphone, but more about the mixing technique afterwards. And that's not just a thrown-together procedure, I'm afraid. No, and also um, the, the camera doesn't really make much difference, does it, for for the, the photo film stuff with the, the audio because it, the, the audio isn't going into the camera when you're there. No. Nope. It's not video. You're not recording directly in nope. through the 3.5mm jack or 2.5mm jack. It might be on the X-T30. So it's it's a separate... What do you use, Philips? No, uh, TX4s? Well, a mixture. Um, I'm changing, actually. I, I use the Sony... Uh, what are what are they? The six fifties, the little six fifties, those little dictaphone ones. They're great, and I use the um, the Zoom F one. But the Zoom F one, if you're thinking about buying a, a lavalier microphone, I have had so many battles with a little battery compartment, which has got a tiny. It's the it's it's the weak point of this mic. Everything else is great about this mic unit except that, because the little um, the little spring clip that. You know, if you're taking batteries in and out and in and out to recharge them, stands to reason you've got to have a really good, strong cover. It's a bit like every time you take an SD card out of a camera, you, you don't you don't want that uh, that cover to start weakening, do you? It's got to be a, it's got to be a strong point of the camera, and that's yeah. a, that's a weak point to this this. And I've lost four, maybe five of those units now because they're useless. Once that spring goes and the batteries keep bing popping out, and I've had this at a wedding oh last year. When I mean, fortunately, I had a backup recording, but um, when I went to take the uh, the unit out of the groom's pocket or the best man or whatever, I I thought that's weird. There's some batteries at the bottom of his pocket here, and I thought, <laughs> oh no, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> But um, yeah, I think I think the the F is it the F two, the yes it's the F two Zoom F two, that's a really really that's quite a new unit, um, and it's quite exciting that one because uh, <laughs> you get excited about these sort of things, Kev. But but it has what's called thirty two bit float audio, which means that well it, it's a bit like I suppose raw photographs. Um, the levels will never be too high. Um, you can move it around in post afterwards so you're not going to get any of this situation where somebody's 
um, distorts the audio because they they start shouting. Um, so that looks really good. The the Zoom F2 and has uh, it also has two takes two AA batteries, so the recording length is humongous. Um, and then there's um, of course you 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 could choose a Tascam unit. Yeah, I got the Tascam. I got four of them after getting inspired by your photo films, and I've never used any of them. Can I have them then? <laughs> if I can find them, yeah, they're yours. <laughs> well, I was just about to buy them, thinking, oh no, I've got to buy them. I'll swap you for some old F ones. <laughs> <laughs> without the batteries but seriously Kev if you've got them I want yeah. them uh, well if I can find them you can have them and one day if I find your 35 mil isn't it somewhere <laughs> you can have that back as well good luck David we're doing that but uh, yeah it's um, it's it's as much really about the post edit as it is about well it's you know it's very important the post edit as it is the kit that you buy Kev yours my question, the next question is from Daniel Kiss, and he says, what is the life expectancy of an X-T3 or X-Pro3 in terms of mechanical shutter actuations? Can I make my camera live longer if I use electronic shutter? I don't think that Fujifilm publish, unlike Canon and Nikon and all that kind of stuff, they, they usually say a sensor life expectancy of, I don't know, 30,000 clicks or whatever it is. And I don't think Fujifilm have ever done that. I might be wrong, but I don't think they have, purely because it's uh, it's a mirrorless camera, so there's, there's a lot less angriness going on inside the camera, so they last a hell of a lot longer. And yes, using the electronic shutter, I would imagine has a le- puts less damage into the, into the mechanisms but at the same time, I wonder if it, it puts more stress on it in other um, in other ways, you know, in terms of the um, engineering and the, the actual electronical stuff that's going on inside. Basically, I haven't got a clue. And so I'm just waffling through this question. But I, I that's my rough estimation is that, yes, mechanical shutter should last for a very long time. Electronic shutter, maybe a bit longer. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I hope you're clear on that one I'm, now, then. I'm a proper pro. <laughs> yeah. Bill, <laughs> shall we move on swiftly? Bill yeah. Bill Hartley, actually, some of your questions are going to be answered today, but I'm not sure because I, um, Carl and I talked for quite a while, so we're going to chop it into two. But um, um, hi, Neil and Kev. Uh, first off, I really enjoyed the show when Gemma stood in. It made a great change. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no more to say to that. few questions. What is the difference between OIS and IBIS? And uh, is uh, O O I S oh. <laughs> optical image stabilization? I was I was just trying to OIS. I thought does, is it ever called OIS? Probably not, is it? And and IBIS and is one better than the other? Well, Carl does actually talk about this, but um, I don't think that he. Ah, yes, no, he did. He did have an answer to this. What would your answer be, Kev? Uh, mine would be mine. Would, well, my understanding is that one of them is in camera stabilization, That's and right. the other one is um, in, in body. Lens. In body. And so in, one's in, in body. Yeah, in camera, in body, and the other one is on the lens. Yeah. Optical image stabilization on the lens. On the lens. Yeah, using uh, little kind of gyroscopes and whatnots. Yeah, but what what what's I better would, than what's the it? other? Oh, I I would say that the camera stabilization is better. Um, probably better purely because it's probably got more, it's nearer the flange point, isn't it? the flange distance, and, you know, it's nearer the sensor and stuff like that, I guess. I ask as I have the Fujifilm 50 to 148 on my X-Pro2, um, and it works. I, you know, that 50 to 140, I did try it on an X-Pro2. It seemed in, entirely the wrong lens camera combo for me. It just didn't seem to be a lens that loved the X-Pro2 much at all. Don't know, mm. what, don't know what you think. Yeah, I mean, some lenses definitely feel better on on the rangefinder style cameras for sure. Yeah, but mm. well, if it works for you, that works well, fine. I'm looking at the XT3, XT4 as part of uh, migration from my current uh, DSLR kit, and therefore, should I worry about IBIS or just get on with it and get the XT3 and save some money? My advice would be, if you are chop chop changing and you're starting afresh, I would say XT4 with the in body image stabilization uh is definitely worth the extra few spondoolies if you can you could save the money but i bet at some stage you'll be thinking oh i wish this had stabilization when i'm shooting for video yeah i agree if you can if you can do it do it mm. um, with my current kit i use a 20 mil 1.8 a lot when i'm close to the subject predominantly car and rugby not people is there a fuji film 
alternative to that lens. Uh, so that's 21.8 on his um, DSLR um, kit. Is there a Fujifilm alternative that you would highly recommend? 21.8? No, 20. 1.8, uh, 20 oh, mil. 20 mil, 1.8. Yeah. Um, well, you've got the 18 mil, 1.4s. Um, yeah, that's probably the closest thing in terms of uh, focus speed and and uh, kind of focal length. Um, it's a bit longer. Yeah. It's 20, but about 20, what's that? Oh, times, uh, 26, 27, 28, something like that, that'll turn into? Oh, uh, yeah, I, keep, I forgot about the, the conversion. Yeah, in which case, uh, yeah, you're looking at the 10, 24, um, the newer 1024, which is a lot faster focusing, um, will give you that range. But it's a slower lens, though. It's a slower lens, f4. Yeah, um, but you know, if it's if it's rugby, yeah, you're not going to need that light. Uh, if it's professional rugby, presumably anyway, you're not going to need, need to worry so much about the, dist- the difference between f4 and f2.8, depending on what kind of um, lighting is there. But whether you want that, um, you know, that that kind of fall off depth of field as they get closer, tearing down your throat, you know, here comes a ball, I want to get it out of focus or yeah. background out of focus, then uh, then you might want to be looking at that 1.8 still. Mm. It's a skill, isn't it, that? Really? Yeah. Um, he had a fourth question. When is Neil having another holiday? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the feeling here, Bill, you'd rather have Gemma. We ain't doing it again. I it get it. Way too stressful. No, I, well, Gemma was, she was the calming influence on you, wasn't she, Gemma? <laughs> so that's ethereal calming influence. <laughs> Gemma has entered the room. <laughs> Um, He had a PS as well. Back in the 80s, myself and a friend were looking to open up a cafe with a potential for live music. We've talked about a cafe, didn't we, Kev? Black and white, we called it, didn't we? Anyway, he was looking for a cafe for uh, potential of live music. It was going to be called Little Willie's Hangout. Uh A fish shop got the lease instead. Do you think maybe that's because they knew what you were going to call it and thought, oh, my God, we can't have that in the neighbourhood? That's brilliant. Little Willie's Hangout. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic! Oh dear. Go on, yours, Kev. I think we, we've. I think we've got time for. Uh, we've got time for one more. Yeah, one more before we uh, speak to uh, speak to Carl. Okay. Uh, right. I'm just randomly diving in. This is from Mark Hall. It says, "Good afternoon. Can someone tell me why Fujifilm hasn't released?" Oh, this already sounds angry. Can someone tell me why Fujifilm hasn't released a firmware update to allow all X Trans Four cameras to save white balance shift? under custom recipes. I would love for my X-T3 to be able to save custom recipes and white balance shift to prevent each time I swap to a different recipe manually dealing that particular shift in, dialing that particular shift in even. Uh, I'd love to even see this implemented in the X-Trans 3 so I could go back to my X-Pro 2 and do it. Well, it's a good point because the sensors, the because the sensors are similar, well, the same, in theory, you should be able to get uh, the same firmware into them, but I do know there is there is some subtle differences between some of the cameras, uh, even if they do share the same sensor. But yeah, I mean, don't know is the answer why they haven't done it. You know, what I will say is that something like that, they're not going to hold it back. They would do it if it was possible, or it certainly might be on the timeline. It's not something they would just hold back because that kind of functionality is not something that's going to stop somebody from upgrading uh, if they have that in an XT3 compared to an XT4. So yeah, if it's if it's doable, I'm sure they will. If it if it isn't doable, then they just won't be able to do it. Simple as that. So don't don't get angry about it. They're not doing it on purpose. They're not they're not doing it just to annoy you. Did he write in capital letters? <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> You always know, don't you? Whenever a question starts with, can somebody tell me why? Yeah. Oh, time to put the tin hats on. I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, I think we have got time for another one, actually, before we uh, before we, we hit Carl. Well, not physically, obviously. That does sound like fun, though. <laughs> yeah. No, you couldn't do that. Um, Marcus Cohen. Um, hi, chaps. Hope you're both well. I've recently been glued to Euro 2020, and it's really interesting to see that tickety-tock-tock tick-tock Uh, One of the main sponsors. When I was speaking to my wife about this, she said there's uh, a big market for companies to sell their service via tickety-tick-tick-tick-tock-tick as it has such a massive following with the younger people. Me, being half a century old, hadn't considered this as a marketing option for a photography business. To be honest, I wouldn't know where to start with tickety-tick-tick-tick-tock-tick. Do you think there is an area to start exploring market opportunities for a wedding photography business? We've we've all seen what's happened with Instagram. 
Could this be the next thing? Maybe some listeners have a point of view on this one as well, which sounds like at the end you're, you're thinking, Marcus, you two are too old to have any kind of thought about this. So we'll just raise it here and wait for the emails to come in. But let's, uh, should we try and put some flesh on the bones, as they say? Well, don't we have to put some, if we're going to do this and like properly on Tickety Talk, we've got to put some fake laugh in over the top, like somebody going. <laughs> yeah. Then a pop song, which I don't quite understand how any of them are legally licensed. Quite right. And then and then you've got to have somebody who's really beautiful who suddenly turns into somebody who's really ugly really quickly. Oh. And then it's got to end really abruptly. That and that is that there we go. There's the recipe to success on Tickety Tick 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 Tock Tick. Yeah. I, I won't be doing Tickety Talk because I can't because I don't let Rosa have it for a start. So what? I can't be on any place <laughs> yeah. to do that. And also all the things that I get sent on the especially on the the, the rugby WhatsApp groups I'm on that they get they spread from Tickety Talk. I'm like, Oh my god. And there's is a reason why I don't want my kids on there. <laughs> I feel like such a bad parent because we 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 have allowed tickety tick tock to to actually infiltrate the house. Although it was a little bit embarrassing on holiday when uh, Thomas was uh, was because he he watches the now. To be fair, he he watches the TikToks that are all about trains, and there's some there's some big train things on there. In fact, on his account, he has he has one video which has I think. A million hits or something, million yeah. likes. I mean, yeah, he got what well, he—he's the first in our family to have a real viral thing go with, um, with with something on a on a social channel. But he was playing it, and, and we were away on this recent holiday. He was just sat at the dinner table, and Grandma was making the. Uh, we were all sat there playing, I don't know, cards or whatever, and Grandma was up there doing the dinner, and he was watching TikTok, and then one of them just said, "Hello, you." F- hey! <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it grandma or grand, granddad that said that no <laughs> they both looked round with equal surprise and we said that's tiktok and grandma was like i don't like tiktok no tiktok yeah, was, that's why i don't like it <laughs> was banned for the rest of the week so yeah it's uh, but i don't know i mean there are Gordon Ramsay uses it quite effectively, doesn't he? But then he's Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. I don't know. He's, uh, God, I really don't know. I mean, I like to think I'm kind of social media savvy, but... Do you understand kind of, it? Is that is that the problem? Yeah, I understand. I do understand it. Yeah, I understand it's... Well, basically, it's, it's appealing to people who need instant gratification and a lot of it. Not really much concentration levels and just need immediate entertainment time and time and time and time and time again, over again, like within a space of a minute. And yeah, it just, it, I don't know. I'd rather read a book. See, I, when you, when you explain it like that, then you wonder, you wonder how it could possibly be useful for wedding photography. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, they will, of course, we're generalizing, of course, but there will be people, you know, of a, of a marriage age who are using it as well. And, and, you know, they're for entertain, it's an entertaining thing, but you know, maybe they will make a decision based on, you know, if they see somebody, ugh, I don't know, it's about attention grabbing, isn't it? I, I, I can't attention grab, I can't grab attention. I can't even grab my toes anymore, let alone attention. It's like, no, nah, no, it's not. Tick, tickety talk can stay tickety talking on somebody else's TikToks. Right. Okay. So we're not likely to see a Mullins tickety talk, talk, tick, tick, talk channel no. No. right i think it's time to talk to this particular man Hail to the chief engineer oh we'll bow down in front of him this is carl Hare, who knows everything there is to know about uh, although he does say during the interview that he's only really just learning himself he's not really though kev is he i mean he's a bit of an expert in this he is he's incredible a very 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 clever man yeah well we've we've split this across two weeks because um there's a lot to talk about what with um things like shutter speeds dynamic ranges things that in the in the past you might have thought if you haven't gone into video yet you've looked at it and thought gee i just don't know all these words i think i'll think i'll just stick with still pictures this the idea of the next couple of weeks is that um you feel you're fearless to turn that button to to the to the video setting and even if you're thinking oh, i'm not sure if i want to touch video or you or you actually work video and quite well i think there's some gems here to be to be had so here's carl Hare. 
Carl, let's start with a basic kit you suggested. Uh, could be good for a, an, init- an initial foothold, if you like. I mean, you, you said XT30 with perhaps an XF 18-55, to 28-4, which is a standard zoom lens. I've got that. But why, why did you suggest that as, as a possible good starter setup? Although, actually, that kit's not really starter, is it? <laughs> no, we, uh, we don't seem to do starter anymore, no, unfortunately. No. But the reason I sort of suggested it is because it's nice and small, nice and lightweight. And it's actually a very, very good camera to learn basics of video, sound. You know, it's essentially a baby X-T3. So it would be something like an X-T30 or maybe an X-S10 if you need a few more features from a newer generation camera. It's interesting, isn't it, when you say it's a good lightweight camera? This is a personal thing. I find I have to have a bit of weight when I'm videoing because... It's it's great to have a light camera when you're photographing, charge around quickly, get what you want, don't come away with that, with our make. But when it's video, I, I almost find the stability of having something heavier, like my X-H1 with a grip on it, really works well for me. I don't know what you find. Yeah, I think it all depends on what sort of videos you're, you're making, really. I think you can help that a lot with different lenses, whether you put something like a 16 to 55 f2.8 on the front, big heavy lens. It's a centre of gravity, a bit more forward, nicer in the hand. Helps out the image stabilisation system a little bit by being a little bit more sort of balanced towards the front where you're holding the camera. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, something like a 50mm f1, which is a big beast of a lens. I, I noticed that you didn't... Uh, we're going to talk about stabilised lenses now, and you didn't have... One, one of my favourites is uh, the good old Workhorse 1024, which I love when I'm shooting video. It gives so much flexibility. But you you didn't um, you didn't pop it down there as one of your suggested lenses. Is um, is there any reason why, or 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 just the eighteen to fifty five? You think is because that, ha- that I suppose that has more throw immediately, doesn't it? Anyway, it has more throw. It's an f two point eight at the wider end, so it's a stop better in low light, and it's generally everyone's first kit in inverted commas lens. You know, it's the lens that they get with their camera. Whereas if you're going to build a video kit, that's a completely different question. And then I would probably put something like the 10 to 24, uh, the 23 F2, the 50 F2 is very, very nice for video and other lenses. But I think it also depends on what type of videos you're going to shoot. If you're going to do sort of blogging, vlogging, YouTube stuff, then the 10 to 24 is really, really useful for some things such as wedding videos. The 10 to 24 absolutely needs to be in the kit bag. I've never really found it in anyone's kit bag for day to day videos. What about the new 18 that we're all very excited about? Oh, well, I'm currently using it as my webcam lens uh, <laughs> on an XS10. It's very, very good. Um, needs to be a little bit closer than sort of the 23 that I was using before. Yeah. But man, what a lens! Yeah, how important is a stabilized lens? I mean, we're talking about the eighteen to fifty-five a moment ago, and that's stabilized. How how important is that for for video work? I'm going to ask some questions which might 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 seem oh come on Neil, don't you know that? But but <laughs> but I think we should start afresh because there are many people that haven't turned the video button on. So so let's go right right from the start with this conversation about having a stabilized lens. So for me, it's one of the the things that I would look for in a in a video lens, just because it's going to help me get the best footage that I can possibly get. Stabilized lenses are sort of your first foray, I guess, into having anything that's stabilized. You'd then go on to something with a stabilized sensor. Then you'd go on to something, maybe a gimbal, perhaps. And then you can sort of combine all three if you need to. I think it's one of the things that a lot of people miss uh, and they'll go for something like a 16 to 55 because it's a brighter lens. It focuses a little bit quicker. The image quality is a touch better, especially into the corners. But you then start to get into the realms of shaky footage. And some people can sort of work around that in their technique, hand holding, breathing, the way that they move. But I think if you're sort of getting into video and you want to video the family, perhaps, or, you know, a day out at the zoo, you don't want to have to be thinking about how you're walking. Do I need to set up a gimbal? Do I need to remember to turn the sensor stabilization on or off or for certain shots? And I think that's the the sort of entry into getting better video. I mean, in, in terms of stabilization, that first in-body stabilization is actually us, isn't it? It's how we use a camera. Now, I find I need to pull my, um, uh, my elbows in and squeeze that camera against my eye. And I've, I've got that contact and stability. 
uh, and then almost position myself like a like a tripod. I must look a bit daft, to be honest, Carl. But but that that <laughs> that's the way that I find it works for me. What's your technique? Yeah, generally camera as close as I can get to me, elbows tucked into my hips and waist, sort of squeezing my tummy. Uh, three points of contact to the body and the camera sort of wedged into my eye socket for most of the stuff that I shoot. That gives me the the, the stablest footage that I can get. Sa- same as you, really, Neil. That sort of tripod stance big wide base nice low center of gravity elbows tucked in that's the sort of first part of stabilization i guess i'm sure we must have eyes that have a ring uh, around it <laughs> when you've when you've been working like that i did hear somebody suggest i mean this really goes uh, for the dslr users i suppose but those that do use a dslr video and you can't look through the mirrorless system Another good way is to is to put the strap re- around, make a slightly shorter strap, and and use the strap as a contact point and push the camera out in front of you, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I don't know if you know where that sort of comes from. It's actually a military SAS shooting technique, believe it? it or not. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's how they sort of implemented the HK MP5 semi-automatic machine gun oh, my word i should, I should never, never push a camera out in front of me again without thinking about that uh, <laughs> st- stabilized lens or a camera with ibis then what's best if you if you chose between the two? Oh, that's a toughie i'd probably sink more of my money into the lens Would i you? think right. in terms of lens image quality and, and things like that okay but but, um, but if you have both um I, I was always advised not to have image stabilization on when the camera has ibis if you have it on a tripod, that is. Is is there a reason for that? Or, or is that something I was told that you're going to say, Neil, who told you that? I might say it was Mullins. <laughs> <laughs> Throw him under the bus. Um, no, we've, we've generally found, coming from the first iterations of image stabilisation, that it certainly didn't help. Right. Primarily because if you get, I don't know, a gust of wind or people walking by shaky ground, the camera tries to correct itself and then picks up it correcting itself as it moving. So it then tries to overcorrect itself, ah. um, which is why people say you shouldn't have stabilization on when you're on a tripod. Right. It doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, engineering and the way that sensors work and lens image stabilization works, OIS has come on a long way since then. But if I'm doing anything on a tripod, panning, moving the camera left and right, I mm. still generally turn stabilisation off if I can, just because I want to try and eke out as much image quality as I can. So turn stabilisation off on your lens if, you are, if you've got it on, on sticks and you're doing a panning shot or something. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And with the, the Fujifilm system, if you've got a lens that's got OIS and an OIS switch on the side of it, so 18 to 55 being a prime example, yeah. if you put that onto something like an X-T4, when you turn the stabilisation off on the lens, it actually turns all the stabilisation off in the camera as well. Mm. It's like a sort of manual override switch, if you will. Let, let's um, let's talk settings. Day out in the park with family. Now, this is something you, you suggested in the Facebook post that you wrote, which was fantastic, by the way. And we're going across a lot of that Facebook post for those that like to hear rather, rather than read and those that aren't in the Facebook group. But um, day out in the park with family... Uh, and then you suggested video conferencing, but you perhaps pointed towards the general settings, maybe being the same. Yeah, I think for, you know, a standard in air quotes video set of base settings, you know, if I'm shooting a one to one with a customer on Zoom or Teams or whatever, I generally use the same sort of settings that I would do if I was out going for a walk and I wanted to video the dogs in the park or yeah you're out with a family and then i would go on from there and change a few settings here and there depending on what i was shooting so in the post that i put up on facebook things like the frame rate might stay the same the shutter speed might stay the same the bit rate and resolution might stay the same but then if i wanted to go more in depth and start shooting slow motion perhaps i would then have to change the settings based on that because you do have a standard recipe setting don't you Film simulation, the turner white balance daylight dynamic range we're going to come to these points in a minute and why uh, 200, highlight plus one, shadow plus one, colour plus one, sharpness minus one, noise reduction minus four. Yeah, so you, you do have a you do have a sort of standard setting, don't you? Yeah, and I've sort of tinkered with that over the last 18 months or so, and that's yeah. what I find for me gives me the most latitude if I do need to edit stuff that's not log footage, which I'm sure we'll go on to yeah, we will. in a bit. <laughs> we will. But yeah, it just gives me a nice base, a nice solid foundation to work from. Right, shutter speed rules double your frame rate, and so on. And shutter angle. Oh, my word. You've thrown all these 
these words at us. What do they mean? Shut- Let's start with shutter speed rules because they are different when you work with video. It- it's counterintuitive for-, for some people. to. This is why I think working sometimes with video and trying to do video and stills at the same time can be a very different and, and awkward um, thing to do. And I-, I try to have one camera set up for video, one set for stills if I'm doing this. And one of those reasons is the shutter speed. Take us through those rules. <laughs> yeah, it can be uh, a bit mind bending sometimes yeah. trying to do both. With the X-T4, we've kind of tried to help you along by having the video and still settings completely separate. So you can set up one versus the other and just flick the switch. But yeah. And that's uh, what yeah. and that's what I'm hoping for, by the way, with the X-H2, he says, nod. <laughs> nod <laughs> I wink. cannot come on in uh, rumours uh, and uh, speculation. I know you can't, but I just thought I'd throw <laughs> it in. <laughs> yeah, I've been waiting, been waiting as well. So for those that perhaps don't have X-T4, you do need to think separately about your shutter speed rules. Yeah, absolutely. I think those that shoot video and stills together well, I put them on a pedestal at God level um, (laughs) because you do need to think about every single setting every single time. So shutter speed in terms of photography, a faster shutter speed freezes action, a slower shutter speed creates more motion. It's kind of similar in video but you've then got to add frame rates and things like that into it as well. So the generally accepted rule for shutter speed in video is it needs to be twice your frame rate. So if your frame rate is 25 frames a second, your shutter speed should be a 50th of a second. And if it's 24p? It needs to be 48th of a second, which we've now started to see in more cameras. Mm -hmm. If it's 30, then it needs to be 60. And even in the slow motion that we've got in some of the cameras, if you shoot at 120 frames a second, your shutter speed should be 240 Mm. of a second. And that comes from, back in the day, rotary shutters. So this is Uh, shutter angle now, isn't it? So this is where shutter angle comes from, Yeah. yeah. Uh, And you'll see this in some very high-end cinema broadcast cameras. And you would have a half shutter or 180 degree shutter, which you would set for your base time frame. So that's where that comes from. But if if you're shooting in 25p, Hmm. does that mean that, okay, you're you're, you're going to have a 50th as a shutter speed? Is is this kind of a, a divisible number? So it can go 50th to 100th? to is is does it work that way no because you'll then start introducing the same principle as photography shutter speed you'll start introducing less flowing motion the faster your shutter speed gets so you'll freeze Uh action but this has been used to good effect in lots and lots of films yeah and you did actually say a a couple of films i think you said saving private ryan and lord of the rings how do you mean it was used to effect because usually if your shutter speed's very high you're gonna have this sort of a very digital effect aren't you rather than the flowing motion that we're talking about with slower shutter speeds yeah so um the shutter speed the camera operator director they use different shutter speeds to create that sort of real jarring Ah. jerky motion for explosions in Saving Private Ryan. Oh, and that would be a very high shutter speed then? Yeah, correct. So Ah. that was, I want to say, about four or five hundredth of a second for that film. So that's where you get that sort of clean, crisp explosion. But the the action and the motion looks really odd and nervous and unsettling, which is exactly what the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan should have felt like. If you can creatively change your shutter speed Mm. for whatever you're filming, it's a good one for people to sort of play with. What about coming down in the shutter speed? So from 50th downwards, what then starts to happen? So then you would get um, more motion blur. So you're filming at 25 frames a second. Let's say you come down to a tenth of a second shutter speed. Mm. You'd get that real, I guess, ethereal, dreamlike motion where everything sort of just seems to blur into one. So if you're making a scene where, you know, I was thinking the other day, you, you could you could use that kind of effect, couldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and this pesky, as you call it, 50 hertz electric cycle that we have in, well, that's the UK cycle anyway. This makes a difference with frame rate, doesn't it? Yeah. So what we don't want is flick, lots of flickering lights in your shots. Mm. And I'm sure if people have ever tried video and set the cameras on auto, you've probably seen this. Yeah. Um, the camera yeah. tries to do as much as it can, but unless you start taking a bit more control Mm. to sort of alleviate the problem. Your your shutter speed should line up with the frequency of your light so you don't see the flickering. Now that's when you go into some, uh, I'm going to use an example here, is wedding venues that have bought bought their beautiful fairy lights online from another country (laughs) that that (laughs) doesn't have the same frequency that we do and but the problem you have is that you've got one set of lights that are and one set of lights that aren't 
is, is there anything you can do in that situation? Put your hands together and pray it all turns out all right. <laughs> the answer is no, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there is, especially with the cheaper LEDs, the more cost-effective LEDs, as you say, that come from other places where the electricity in Hertz is a different frequency to ours yeah. if you're using lights that come from america which is 60 hertz you can get transformers that smooth them out to 50 hertz right. or just pay a bit more money for better led lighting or continuous lighting or that's the time where you might change your frame rate isn't it potentially yeah yeah and then work the american way if you like 24p yeah. recommended apertures if, you, if you're in autofocus you can probably go shallow without too much drama but when you're manually focusing that becomes a different adventure, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's where the most underrated person in films comes in, the focus puller. Yeah. So what is a, <laughs> Obviously, fo what is a focus puller, first of all? A focus puller is a dedicated person on set that just adjusts the lens focus. Right. That's all they do. And they get paid lots of money. They do, don't they? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was talking to a, a guy before COVID happened. I did a, a show at BSC yeah. uh, in London, yeah. and he was a focus puller for the Dunkirk film. And he was on set, obviously, for however long it was. And you're working with camera operators, directors, you know, cinematographers that have got this vision. And if, if you don't get it right by two millimetres on the lens, the shot's completely useless. Oh. So they really come into their own in that environment. Obviously, not everyone's going to have their own focus puller. No, we don't have our dedicated focus pullers in our in our life usually. So, so are you going to suggest then we stick to auto? Yeah, because it's it's come on a long way since uh, the XT one, X Pro one started autofocus, especially, um, and lens autofocus has come on massively in the last yeah. couple of years. For tracking focus, eye autofocus. You know, we've now got animal autofocus. Um, who would have thought that would have been a thing in sort of three or four years well, ago? No, if I poke my, uh, my my camera at a mullin, so I'm going to set it in animal mode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless him. It'll pick his eyebrows out. I think he's a, a wild cat. <laughs> Sorry, Mullins. Um, but, but I mean, manually focusing then. Use, because I, I've, been a, I've been a manual focus focuser forever, it seems. Maybe it's just a habit I got into. But you're suggesting trust it, Neil. Trust the force. Let the force be with you. Switch that button to autofocus. Yeah, and there's a few, a few things that you can do that can help out as well, especially if you want that sort of really smooth focus pull look in autofocus as well okay. so i've actually sat and gone through every lens in my kit bag and i've worked out the autofocus continuous custom setting for each of my lenses wow you did... sad right no no well, i was going to say you <laughs> you used covid shutdown wisely i tried i tried to <laughs> help myself as much as i could especially yeah. for video because realistically i'm still new to video as well so so this amazing spreadsheet that you've made of, of lenses and what works best is is that publicly available or, or do we have to cross your palm palm with silver <laughs> i'm going to try and put it together in a more yeah. succinct piece of data right and i'll i'll try and get that out to people or yeah. out on the facebook group or to fujifilm to publish or whatever okay. needs to happen with well, it but there, there is a reason to join our facebook group if ever there were one there you um, go because, go because that that is incredible work so you've worked out what what tracking sensitivity works best with each yeah with, with every lens in my kit bag wow. that i would use for video wow in in terms of of autofocus um there are two well, there are many different ways you can use video but talking heads and moving through you know action are, are the two obvious ones how would you set your camera up with autofocus for each for a talking head it's the standard youtuber podcast you know my one-to-one -one settings that i use for the, the fujifilm video one-to-ones so i've got the 18 mil f1.4 i shoot it at f1.4 i put it in eye autofocus and i pick an eye mm. just so that the camera doesn't sort of get confused currently let me turn my camera on and i'll walk you through my settings mm. uh, tracking sensitivity of plus two mm -hmm. which is in the middle of the scale and then i have af speed at minus two so it slows down that autofocus to make it more of a focus roll or focus pull so it's rather a, than it's slightly slower to go in and out of focus but when it does so it's it's more natural looking is that what you mean by that yes yeah, so it's more natural looking as if you were manually focusing the lens so it doesn't s snap focus it's it's going to gently come into you correct right there's nothing worse than seeing a piece of video and suddenly the autofocus has 
gone from front to back really fast and yeah. you're like oh yeah but if that's the you know if you're shooting a film and that's what you want then that's what you want so then i would go the other way and quicken it up and make it even faster how does the camera remember uh, that that it's going to do this to each different lens separately or or do you have to have settings you have to change them when you change the lenses so i've got a, a list in my notes on my phone for the lenses that i most commonly use and then i just go in and change those per lens oh, might, might i suggest this is another thing to come for the xh2 anyway moving on um, <laughs> So I might I see how many XH2 mentions I can get into the, the next few moments. Um, one thing that does interest me is is if you are working alone, you've mentioned YouTube and you've mentioned you know talking heads, and sometimes you might want to do something to camera that's a, a, a bit of a medley of the both, I suppose. Um, if you put the camera in front of you, set up yep. your autofocus, set it running, and then walk around the desk and sit in front of it, are you expecting it to do what it needs to do? I found that the focus, especially on the T3, T4, the XS10, is very, very good, and it'll pick up a face yeah. nigh on when it comes into frame. But but it should, if you dance in and out a bit, it should pick you up. If you've put eye focus on in particular, it should work quite quite well. Yeah. Um, gimbal. Well, you, you mentioned gimbal quite a while ago. What do you do focus-wise when you're using a gimbal? Do you set it to auto, or do you set manual and calculate your safe distance, which is my dangerous way of working? <laughs> <laughs> Again, it depends on the shot that I'm doing. If I'm doing a, a piece of B-roll shooting where I need, let's say I'm shooting a camera and I'm going to push the camera from me to the camera and make it come in and out of focus as I push the camera forward. Yeah. I would then manually focus. Um, I would generally set the camera when I push the camera forward, set my focus so that, let's say, the Fujifilm logo is in focus when the camera's at its closest and then leave it there. So when I pull the camera back, it sort of goes softly out of focus. Mm. But if I'm shooting some behind the scenes footage of an event or, you know, if we do photography workshops or a photographer event and need to get some footage, then I'll just stick the camera into autofocus, oh, yeah. continuous autofocus and use very similar settings to what I would use for a talking head to get that manual focus roll. If I need it to be slightly quicker, then I'll quicken up the focus. If I need it to be slightly slower, I'll slow it down. Well, it's not, it's not a classic cliffhanger, granted, but that's part one of Carl's quest to help you understand what the video button or what, what world the video button on your Fujifilm camera can open you to. Next week, we continue with stuff like uh, what does dynamic range mean and video compression and try to, uh, try to make things uh, like that easier to understand. We also talk about sound. And what we've done is post at the top of the Fujicast Facebook group a post where Carl can answer any other questions you may have, having heard part one this week and part two next. Of course, Carl Hare is a Fujifilm product specialist. He doesn't work for this show, so bear with him if it takes a, a couple of days, a few days to get back to you. We're just very, very thankful he's happy to lend us his brain. Before we return to your questions, uh, and of course, Book of the Week, just a shameless plug for my other podcast, Photography Daily. On Wednesday, we're going on the road. Well, not we exactly, but I talked with a photographer called Ryan Visions, who has got himself a van and decided with his dog to take time out of mainstream life and make a photo book featuring pictures from every single US state. Find out why, how, when and everything in between when it comes to being at one with a, a camera on the open road. Van lifing on Wednesday. A big part of this journey was self-healing and finding who I am and also who I am as a photographer. And so for me, it's important to experience things that I don't take photos of too. Photography Daily is available wherever you get your podcasts and I'm looking forward to talking to Ryan. And our thanks this week on the Fujicast to Carl Hare for part one of Turn That Video Button On! Part two is coming next week. And he breaks it down quite nicely as well. He's, um, he's not one of these guys that leaves you confumbled. Carl has got a way of explaining things, hasn't he, Kev? I've been confumbled with him before. Have you? Oh. Usually quite late at night, but yeah. I'm sorry to hear it. Where's, um, where's your... We started the, the show by having a package um, expectation. Has it arrived, Kev? Has your monitor oh, here? It disappeared now off the map. Hmm. Normally, he, he got to number 65, I was number 102, and now it's gone. It just says your package was due, is due for delivery yesterday, mm. and that's it, gone. Well, the good it, news is, I suppose, if it was 65, only uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or whatever it is, 45 minutes ago. Does my head in with so much. It was meant to come yesterday, then it didn't turn up, now it's coming today, and now it's disappeared. 
Uh, you know, you know, you know where it is, though, Kev. It's going to be like like the last package um, about a month ago when 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 there was one arriving during the show. It's going to be at the co-op, Kev. <laughs> I don't Isn't think it? they'll leave a twenty-five kilogram monitor at the co-op. Oh, they might do. You might find it in frozen veg. I'll have to get a pizza and four beers while I'm there. Then <laughs> that's a good idea. What's that big box doing over there in frozen veg? Ah, oh, it's just Kev's monitor. I'll leave it there then. He's oh. always leaving his stuff here. Oh. Well, hopefully it will arrive. It's like uh, it, otherwise it's going to be box gate of a different we haven't had a box gate thing for forever it seems oh, gone away no it hasn't will colin hi neil hi kev love the show yada yada now box gate <laughs> <laughs> here's my two penny worth it's all down to what economists call information asymmetry the seller of the camera knows more about its condition than the prospective buyer he or she has more information so there's an asymmetry here he or she knows if it's got a glitchy card slot or if it's been to the bottom of a swimming pool The prospective buyer doesn't know this, or at least has to take on trust whatever the seller tells them. Economists say that information asymmetry reduces the efficiency of a market so that sellers don't receive the true value for their goods. So why does it increase the selling price if you keep the box? Because it acts as a signal to the buyer. It Mm. provides additional information and reduces information asymmetry. Correct. Uh, and I, because I do have an economics degree, I understood all of that. However, I still do not understand why people, not the sellers, I understand why people keep their boxes if they're going to sell it. It's the people who buy things and pay more for exactly the same thing because it's in a frigging box. Yeah, but Kev, you've, you, you've just answered your own question by understanding this information asymmetry thing that you learned. I mean, I didn't know this, of course, in your degree. I mean, it's to do with trust and a very real human trust trait i mean the 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 idea that you're uh, you're needing this kind of visual cue because as the buyer i i don't know what you did with this kit before kevin in a box i kind of feel cuddled but but without it i'm thinking what if mullins threw this in a swimming pool which we know you did to a camera that's that still works perfectly boxes kev it's all about the box I did a one to one earlier with uh, with a guy, um, Peter, and he he makes he sells cardboard box cardboard boxes for that's his job, and uh, and he's, <laughs> the demand for cardboard boxes is enormous at the moment. Uh, <laughs> God, so that, like, that, recycle them, buy more. That's the business to be in, isn't it, Kev? Hey, eh? yeah. yeah. Um, I think. Thank you, Will. Um, including the box signals that the seller is more likely to be careful, fastidious and organised. See, I'd never heard of information asymmetry before, but now I have. There we go. He says, don't suppose it will change Kev's mind, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> no right. it hasn't. <laughs> right, moving on. Kev's question. Uh, OK, this is from Paul Waring. He says, hello to both of you. Uh, hope the family and the horse are well. Hmm. More of a talking point than a technical question. If weddings were to cease to exist, uh, he puts in brackets, sore subject currently, and you still needed to make a living, would you remain with photography and try to make a go of it? In another genre, uh, such as photographing corporate events or hotel interiors, or would it be time to turn over photography into a hobby and become an Amazon driver? <laughs> we talk, <laughs> kind of talked about this last week a bit, didn't we? We did. Um, I did something on um, on the on the Photography Daily Patreon channel about, um, and I used the word mutation purposefully because, of course, that's a word of the the moment, isn't it? Uh, of uh, of genre mutation of of you know having to think right i've got to do something else and i would actually there's so many things that i think wedding photography has provided us both really kev in terms of knowledge base i'm not not suggesting we'd we'd do any of these things professionally necessarily but we've become landscape photographers food photographers we're photo journalists we're quite good editorial photographers i think in that respect as well portrait mm, and i know you haven't done so many portraits and it's not not something you're necessarily interested in although having said that your amazing work with your gfx that's portraits so maybe weddings have taught you that as well kev there's all these extra skills isn't there that that we've gleaned through being uh, wedding photographers that could be could i think easily be could easily mutate um mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, I agree. And and uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's that unreasonable to think that we'll be shooting less weddings going forward. Not, you know, not just because of the pandemic, but, you know, things like age and what have you, you know, to have an impact, don't they? And, uh, you know, the, the, the dynamics of your family change, all kinds of things happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've even, I've set up my own little um, corporate website that is, and I have got some corporate work coming in from it. And it's, yeah, events, taking pictures of people at events, that kind of thing, having awards, those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'm kind of preparing for shooting less weddings for sure, or certainly 
certainly less weekend work. But saying that, if I was not, uh, you know, I always want to be a mainly wedding photographer. This is kind of backup stuff. And if that did just disappear, like if weddings became illegal or something like that, then would I, you know, still be a photographer? Probably it would have to just be a hobby thing because I don't think I could make enough money from it in any other way. Yeah, I, I would... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'd be an I certainly wouldn't be a DHL driver. <laughs> I might uh, I might do something else, yeah. We could open that, that potato shop. Well, I think the Grumpy Potato is a great idea. Or our black and white cafe, Kev. I mean, yeah. really. I've, I've seen Malmesbury. It's waiting for this. Mm. What about that shop that you used to have um, when I first knew you? Which I think, I think maybe, did you have the upstairs room, but you own the shop at the front as well? That's a great place. Yeah, I did. It's a, um, yeah, what do they call it now? Old things. What are those old things people buy? Um, Vin- vintage clothes? Uh, and, uh, antiques? Like little statues and stuff. Antiques. It's an antique shop. Oh, I, yeah. thought, I thought for a minute you were going to say it was what we famously call shop of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a bit of that in it, yeah. There's a lot of dusty stuff in the window that nobody seems to want to buy. No, but it's when you go to these shops, I mean, often they, they, they frequent um, holiday destinations, and you think, well, it's, it's like a shop of shit. I mean, how does this stuff sell? Yeah, I, I do. I've always wondered, you know, if you if you are the salesperson and you go to one of these, one of these shops of shit and you say, what you need is you need a clamshell that says, welcome to whatever the town is, that's really badly glued together and bits are falling off. And, and, and the person behind the shop says, that's classic. That really, that's quality that mate. I'll have, I'll have, uh, how many have you got? I have a box of 5,000. Terrific. <laughs> yeah. You do see some, some tats <laughs> you, in these places. Yeah, tat <laughs> shop, tat <laughs> shop, that's it. I don't <laughs> think Malmesbury's ready for a tat shop. No, no, I don't think so either. I don't think so. Not that kind of place. But yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I don't know, Kev. Well, what is your um, what's your commercial website then? So the website is called flyingmonk.agency. There we go. Flyingmonk.agency. Oh, yeah, there's a flying monk on the front. Where'd you get him from? <laughs> uh, there's not a flying monk on the front. There is. Look, it goes all the way across. I like the name of the company, though. I do like nope. that. Well, the flying monk is Malmesbury, isn't it? So Aldam, Aldam was the monk in Malmesbury in, I don't know, the year 200 or something, was the first fella to try and fly. It didn't work, but he tried. So Malmesbury is known as the flying monk. At least it's not one of those companies that you, you, you have to take a colour and then an animal that wouldn't be the, the colour of the animal. Pink so fish. Red frog. Green elephant. <laughs> exactly. It works. Brilliant. You've got it. London Agency. Yeah, that's it. Sorted. And, yeah. and is that is that... Is that working out okay for you? Why Why did you put your? Is there a reason why you separated that from from a general photography website? We talked about this. I know a lot, but people join us all the time. Yes, the the, the, the honest to god truth about the the existence of this website is because I had a somebody put me in touch with a business and they said, right, we need you to do a um, a quote. Mm. Can you give us, uh, show us some examples of your commercial work? We like your wedding work, but we want to see some examples of your commercial work. So I obviously didn't have anything really. And, and so I put this web, I did it in Squarespace. It took me an hour and a half to do the entire website. Mm-hmm. And then I had, to, I had something for them. I had a portfolio that I could send to them. And it's not really a portfolio as such, the blog post really. And, and that worked. And then they were happy with that. And it just looked more professional for them rather than, the, the whole wedding site, wedding website thing. So I think commercial stuff I would always keep d- separate. Family stuff I would be happy to merge in with the uh, wedding stuff, and maybe to a certain extent portraits. But but yeah, not um, not commercial stuff because it's it's just boring. It's totally boring in, in in you know in in comparison. The concept then really is is it's an online portfolio. That's yeah. It's, yeah 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 yeah. It's just there. So if anybody says what's your uh, website for your commercial stuff, then I've got something to to send them. Well, the only reason I ask, and because it's a very good question in in terms of um, having to expand and think out out outside their box. Sorry, that was a terrible corporate expression, old old one. But is that I, I'm acutely aware across the years, and I don't know whether you feel this as well, Kev, of of shooting weddings. I'm sure you've been asked the question, and you've probably taken it the wrong way, like I have, when somebody says. Is this all you do, wedding photography? And you get ex- extremely defensive about it. Say, well, no, it's quite a, you know, it takes a lot of my time during the week, blah, 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 blah. When, when actually they might have been saying, oh, I just wonder because I've got 100 people I'd like you to photograph in my company. I think there's been, there's been so many opportunities I have probably missed uh, through the years of not having commercial in some way tied in with the wedding work, which I know for a lot of people is like, it's like fingernails down a, down a chalkboard um in in the in the list of the things you should not do with wedding photography websites 
Mm. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I think for most people, I think nowadays, you know, people see wedding photography generally as more, much more artistic than it perhaps used to be known as. So yeah, I'm not so fussed about that. But yeah, probably that question, when you do get asked that question, is that all you do? And you just kind of go, yeah, what's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that, is there? That's what I do. What do you do? You know? <laughs> And, and really they're thinking, yes, well, we've got a thousand pound contract you could have if you, yeah. if you did do other things as well. <laughs> There's a gun, shoot yourself in the foot. I know, but, but portraits, I'd like to do portraits, definitely. Mm-hmm. I think you get of an age as well, I certainly feel myself, where, where you feel, I know this is, probably says more about me, uh, but um, a credibility for a genre, which you may not have felt before. I never felt credible um, in my 30s, trying to get blue chip companies to hire me as a photographer for X, Y, Z. I don't know why, but I just didn't. And now I feel like I could go into a boardroom with uh, fellow um, grey bearded gents and, and make these pictures. And maybe grey bearded women as well, because it's equal opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. You, you know, I think it is just confident. As you get older, you get more confident, don't you? And also, I think you get to the point in life where you, you don't suffer fools gladly anymore. And you, you know, you, you understand that you could just go somewhere, have a serious and sensible conversation. And if it wasn't something that was going to work for either of you, that you could walk away. Whereas yeah. perhaps when you're a bit younger, um, and I think I, I was the same, you, you, you tend to get a little bit hoodwinked and, uh, you know, not back yourself so much and just kind of follow the toe the line and end up doing things that you didn't really want to do or doing things the way you didn't want to do it, perhaps. How long do you think you could do it, Kev? How long do you think you can carry on f- photographing in, in whatever genre? Oh, well, forever. I love it. You know, I do love it. And I, I, I definitely won't stop it. And I don't want to stop wedding photography either. It's just, I, you know, I, I'm... I'm you know, I'm, I'm kind of fairly confident that it won't be like it was mm. before. I think the landscape of weddings has changed, you know, and that's uh, and I'm working. On, I'm thinking once the this uh, pandemic is under control and everything. And I just think things things have changed a little bit like the, the working office scenario will have changed forever. Uh, regardless what, you know, Morgan Stanley says, you know, it's it's changed it has changed simple as that were morgan stanley the ones that said uh, people are just going to be back in offices again yeah they've got to go back to work so they, they have to go back to the office and he, he had a very valid point in fairness the, the the chief of morgan stanley i mean they're they're notorious for working their people hard but you know they pay very well as well but he he was saying that this is our learning ground this is where people learn this is how they know how to become more, how to be morgan stanley part of the morgan stanley family you will not get that over zoom and he's right he's absolutely right about that but there's going to be a hell of a lot of companies that are not Morgan Stanley are thinking, oh, I don't need to pay my £900,000 a month rent because it's clearly working that people are working at home. I wonder how much, I wonder how the landscape of weddings will change. I don't know. I, I don't know. I just I just have a feeling it will. And whether that is, uh, you know, law laws may change, that people, the, the flexibility of marriages can change. Um, I think we've seen that to a certain extent coming in already. And, uh, you know, I, I just think things will change. Yeah, I just, you know, I do. Less people get married as well you know and uh it's not i'm not trying to be negative here i'm just kind of saying that i think i still think there's gonna be plenty of work for everybody to go around i just think that the way that the operation will will be might have changed and so i'm just kind of preparing myself for that but in my mind you know i only ever really did about 25 weddings a year anyway so in my mind i'm thinking 20 to 25 is now kind of the maximum and i'm gonna uh, you know i'm gonna be pricing myself accordingly for that rather than you know effectively taking as much as i can and you know going through the year um but who knows who knows it might be me driving the amazon van next year and you shooting 65 destination weddings in (laughs) turkey or wherever i'm not i'm not sure about that Um, i've had loads of inquiries that recently last last week or so i say it's probably three or four um from abroad for weddings in europe yeah you know and and i'm just saying no Nope, nope, nope. You're, you're saying no, though, because of the, the whole Brexit thing, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Sorry, did yeah, I yeah. say, I, so I must put my teeth in. Hold on. If kids are listening in the car, they're Brexit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on with my teeth there. Anyway, um, should we do book club? Yes, let's do book club. Yes. Oh, I'm just picking it up. Island time. <laughs> 
Ta-da! As if it's a surprise, uh, Alien Tides by Paul Glazier. Yeah. Um, and I will, I'll just read the, um, the, the I was going to read it off the Kickstarter page, but actually I'll read it off the back, back cover instead. And it says, because uh, it's a little bit shorter, it says, In 1978, Paul Glazier first visited and started photographing the remote Scottish island of Vahatasay in the Outer Hebrides. Since then, children have become parents and their parents, grandparents. Island Tides is his record of island life, with photographs dating from 1980 until the present day it's a book of beautiful if bleak landscapes and portraits of the small resilient community who love who live there and yeah that sums it up nicely it's a, a as always with the blue coat press stuff it's beautifully produced and yeah. uh, this is a square format book hardback uh, it's quite heavy to lift over oh and here we go on the front on the inside front cover because of the the level of kickstarter i did i've got a signed print as well mm. which is very nice um so the print I've got is of three lads playing on a on a fishing boat on the beach. Oh, I know the picture. I can see it here. Yeah, what a fantastic picture! Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what what you have in this book is all kinds of different things. If you like, you've got portraits. You've got some really beautiful, well considered um, landscapes. You've got what people might consider snapshots of things going on in the streets. You've got some. You know, you've got kids playing. You've got. You, you get a real sense, I think, when I, I flick through this book, a world that is just so different, even though it's British and part of Britain. It just looks incredible. And, you you know, you kind of get an idea of the idyllic nature of it, but also you can imagine how bleak it is. I mean, there's a picture here on page nine of the beach, and, and that's where the cows are, are um, grazing <laughs> on the beach. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, brilliant, lovely. And then, I mean, these lo- the lovely wide vistas of the, the little tiny settlements. Um, you know, there's a dam there at one point and there's like six or seven dotted houses. And you can see them. They're all hunkered down into the ground because obviously the weather in the winter there is pretty brutal. Uh, the wind and the rain and stuff. And, and the pictures I like really, or I like the most, I should say, are the, the simple portraits of people in their houses. Um, so on page 31 here, we've got a picture. None of these have any kind of text or description on pages. So it's just, you know, it's just simple, beautiful photography. And it's just the guy sat there in his little wooden chair. And it, it looks like the, the decoration of the house and the way it's structured looks like it could be 1930 rather than 1980. Um you know, it's very reminds me of kind of the world that kind of stood still, if you like. And then there's pictures later on of the of the sheep shearing, so the entire community getting involved in that. Um, and then obviously the fishermen, big importance up there. Yeah, really, really nice. I, you know, I think that it's one of those books that you very few of us will have been to that particular island, even if you have been to the Outer Hebrides. You know, you may have done, so it may it may kind of bring um, bring back memories. But for the rest of us, it probably think you, you know it's 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 like one of like watching a documentary on telly where you're just thinking my god these places are just not that far away but exist and they're so isolated that they you know they have this you know i always think about these places in the night time when the when the last boat goes on a thursday and he's not coming back till wednesday they draw you know they, they wave the boat off and then, and that's it you know and and if they run out of beer <laughs> they're stuffed <laughs> i thought you might think of the beer yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and but that's it, isn't it? It's a very, it's like living on a on a um, lighthouse in the middle of the Atlantic. Oh, I've think. always fancied that, Kev. I, I I have to say that there's there's a lighthouse out here. It's just off the coast of Norway, which you can stay on actually. Which, which to me, that looks like if I was a writer, I'd love to live in a lighthouse and just write. And there's a big romantic sort of thing about i think lighthouses for me and these these sort of places as well i think this probably would have been one of the best places to have lived when the when the pandemic first flamed yeah oh absolutely and yeah i mean going back to lighthouses i i would i would love to do that also but it would have to be a lighthouse that has really extreme weather that's what i want i don't want to be in one that's where it's nice and sunny and just sit on the top of somebody's i want to be batting the hatches down and protecting myself from those massive waves and all that kind of stuff somewhere like uh the needles just off um the isle of wight which is always a bit rough there yeah well, well, it's not yeah. that rough, I suppose, but it can be. It can be. Yeah, yeah. No, I, love, I love all that stuff. Anyway, so yeah, the book Island Tides, uh, Paul Glazier, beautiful, really nice book. I'm going to actually just have a quick look to see if it's uh, openly available. Um, While you're looking, one of the things I really like about this is the uh, is the generational aspect to it. That the now the nostalgia because because it's across lots of years really means so much more, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's in, still in stock. Uh, Bluecoatpress.co.uk and uh, £28 gets you that wonderful book. Island Tides. 
by Paul Glazier, who is not Starsky or Hutch. <laughs> no, right. no, nor the one at a Cagney Lacey. No. Um, Matthias Fox. Um, hi, gents. You've asked for mails on the, uh, the Fuji cast. Um, as a listener since episode one, I like to oblige. During the pandemic, since March 2020, I started a photo project trying to document the look and feel of this period, which we've considered to last, well, which we considered to last for a few months maximum. Oh, God, yeah. I plan to create the book, not for the public, only for me and some photo interested friends. But since the pandemic is still current now, I'm struggling with the project. The book was scheduled for the end of 2020, assuming Corona would be an issue of the past by then. Lost face masks, distant signs, closed playgrounds. All looked like interesting topics last year, but are very familiar today. I just don't think that a book right now would be of any interest, since the situation is still present. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd add on this as, as well, that some people are like, oh no, pandemic. Do you have any thoughts on that? Should I wait another year, hoping that Corona in the rear view mirror might be more interesting? I attached some images, um, which, I, uh, which we'll put on the show notes today, so you get an impression. Best, best regards. Thanks for the great work from Matt. Hmm. What do you think? Well, I think at the moment people are pandemic weary. And even though last week we did talk about Chris O'Sullivan's great work about, you know, the the quietness of the pandemic when it first started. Yes, I think we've got to a stage where we're thinking, how long does this last? Really? Hmm. When, when will I wake up? Well, could somebody pinch me and will it all be over? And I, I wonder if there's a weariness to that. But um, funny enough, I talked to Tom Stoddart for an interview last week on PD, and, and, and he was saying, you know, the pictures you take... And you've, you've said this as well, Kev. I think he copied this off you, Kev. That the pictures you make today are, are not as important as they will be 10, 20, whatever years to come. So you're letting the, this work really mature, aren't you? Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, he stole that off me, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he did. But will there be too much of this particular work around, perhaps? Well, I, I, I don't know whether there'll be too much, but, you know, only the, the good stuff will, will basically, or the stuff that gives the most nostalgia will rise to the top, won't it, as it, as it kind of comes and goes. I have to say, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit, you know, weary. And, and y y you don't see it so much on the on the news websites anymore, you know, such and such as photographer uh, photographs locked down in his, his local street. And there was, that was big thing wasn't it for a while yeah. uh, and that seems to have gone away you know at the end of the day you've got to do what you want to do because you you know you you either you're enjoying it or you're you're doing it for you know your, your own reason for your own kind of future memories and that shouldn't stop you um but you know i think that to be totally brutal if it's if it's really 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 good then it will it will it will still you know have a place but if it's uh you know if it, if it's not then then it won't and then there's a lot out there that it, that is is not I, and i'm not saying like if i did it it definitely wouldn't be good enough but i'm just saying that you know the the ones that will be probably hitting the hitting the top notes in the future are, are going to be the the photojournalists and stuff like that who have gone out there and perhaps on commission and and you know really really kind of thought about them as projects the, the kind of home the home photos will will i think have less impact because it has such a uh, it's been embellished on so many people's memories. I might be totally wrong with that, but that's that's my gut feeling about it. But it's finding an intriguing angle, isn't there? There was a I, I spoke to an Irish um, press photographer who'd found um, a, a, a really good angle on the stories because he couldn't. Well, he could get into grounds, but there was, as he said, there was nothing going on in the grounds. It was a fairly sort of sterile atmosphere, and so he took to photographing outside the boundaries of these of these stadia. And there's one particular picture where he's got, it's the back of a rugby club, and there's just this ladder um, with this guy that's in a graveyard, which makes it even more interesting. And he's climbed up the ladder, and all you see is his feet because he's watching the match the other side. So that mm -hmm. that's a case of trying to find a different angle. But I, I wonder, have you seen many projects in this time, Kev, where you've thought, oh, that's a unique angle. Oh, why didn't I think of that idea? I haven't, I haven't, seen, I haven't seen a lot of that. No, no, I haven't, to be honest with you. But then perhaps I haven't been looking for it. So mm. maybe they are there. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of great stuff. Uh, you, you know, we had um, Christopher's book, you know, which is great and you know, we've seen a lot of stuff for sure. You know, people are, are approaching it in different ways. But yeah, you're right. Is there been anything that's that's totally, totally different? Is it possible? Maybe it's not even possible for that to exist. Who knows? Don't know. I, I think the social observation stuff is is really good. And there's one, and I uh, we'll we'll show these on the show notes page today. But there's one of um, 
of a, a football what looks like a sort of a football ground here. And what they've done, what the what the grounds uh, um, people have done is, is they've got the um, the goals and they're still netted up. And what they've done to stop people playing is push the goals together so they face each other. So you, you can't actually use a goal. I mean, that's yeah. kind of social document stuff. You think, What's going on there? Ah, oh, right. Okay, because they didn't want people to... Oh, well, I see. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah all of that stuff. I remember Martin Parr did a series in Bristol shortly after the first lockdown, and it was mostly of the... Uh, not mostly, but some of the images were of the uh, the child swings and stuff that had been roped up yeah. so they, could, they couldn't go on them. Yeah. Um, how are we doing for time? Do, do, do. Is the he's the man there yet? Is the DHL man there yet? No, I am oh. using the will. It's gone off the system. It now says, yeah, we're sorry, but this was yesterday. We're sorry, but the delivery of your shipment has been delayed. We expect to deliver on the next working day. And all day today, it's been updating. Like, so on the 18th, boom, boom, boom. He's now at number 65 on 102. That's all disappeared. And now the last thing that's on there is, we're sorry, but the delivery of shipments has been delayed. We expect to deliver on the next working day. And that was yesterday. Oh, so you're back into where you... Have they sent you the same loop mail then? Oh, it's, the little maps disappeared, everything. Oh. There's no number to ring. You press... Even the DHL website, if you click on the customer support link, it goes to a 404. <laughs> oh, no. Well, at least DPD Dave doesn't do this in our town. No, a DPD is great because the DPD app, you can actually ring your driver. You can actually get a message to him. Can you? Oh, I must. I'll invite DPD Dave in for a coffee. He's brilliant. Yeah, I agree. He brought the X100V to me the other day. He started asking. He now says, what's in this box then? <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit worrying. <laughs> I think Dave's casing the joint. Um, yeah, I think we've got time for one more quickie, so to speak. Uh, okay. Oh, my God. Are you asking me then? Yeah. Right. Have you, got, have you got one there that we could do? Yeah, I've got one. Go on, then. This is from Stephen Anker. It's from five weeks ago, but I've just found it. Uh, it's a question for Neil, please. Can you send a signed photo to my wife and play Captain Beaky and Oh, we've had this, Kev. You said this to me before. You're not going to let this one drop. No, I haven't put my little emoji underneath. I wouldn't have done that. You did. I remember. Uh, did I read it then, Captain Beaky? Um, maybe you did. All right, let's maybe. just ditch that. Maybe that's him. <laughs> that was it. That was the last <laughs> yeah. question. I get a sticker. I get a sticker that emoji underneath it. <laughs> Stick an emoji underneath that one. That well, that's it then, Kev. We've run out of questions. The end. Hmm. What do people do then if they want this to continue next week in the Facebook group? We need more questions. So, <laughs> well, that's it. Simple, simple request then. Send more questions via the Facebook group or or email to click at fujicast.co.uk. Make them uh, up if you have to. It doesn't have to be real. <laughs> doesn't have to be real? What do you mean? Well, they can just make it up. Just pretend you've got an XT4 or something. <laughs> or it doesn't even have to be about cameras. It could oh, be about anything. Kev, what's up to your authenticity, boy? <laughs> oh. um, yes, so send your questions in. And um, uh, anything of interest at all, click at fujicast.co.uk or, of course, in the, the Facebook group where you'll find it. Uh, you'll find it in the thread. Thank you to those that are supporting the show by Patreon. If you can do it, fantastic for those that feel it's appropriate, of course. Not just for us, but for your pocket too. But the donations will help this show stay here. It's an ongoing project. Um, thank you to Carl Hare. Now, he does return next week for a second part. It's a two-parter, is Carl, uh, all about video. Um, if you want to see our offerings for the photo community, visit fujicast.co.uk for all the links on uh, today's show, etc., etc. Music from Blue Wednesday, uh, supporting music for the incredible artlist.io. I hope your box is going to turn up, Kev, but oh, I don't know. Are we, are we still going to be talking about this next week, perhaps? Oh. I've bought something else by then. You bought, sorry, what was that? You sort of faded out, Kev. I'll have bought something else by then. All right, okay. I think Kev's grumpy. See you next week, Kev. Bye. Bye. The FujiCast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.